Hello and welcome. I'm Marites Vitug and today we have a special episode of Rappler Talk for Rappler's 10th anniversary. Since its founding, this is the first time that the four founders, we fondly call the Manangs, will sit down to talk about Rappler's 10 years. Today with me is Glenda Gloria, Rappler's executive editor, who was managing editor for nine years. Before Rappler, I worked with Glenda in Newsbreak, where she was also managing editor. And before that, we wrote a book together on Mindanao in 2010. So really, Glenda and I have known each other for 100 years. But of course, uh, she always wants it clear that she's much younger than me. So Glenda, it's good to talk to you uh, online for this uh, founding anniversary special. Maybe first, let's go back in time. Uh, how remember that we were in Newsbreak, a, a small little brave magazine, which eventually went online. But be, when we were online, remember that uh, we partnered with a giant, ABS-CBN. Maria Reza asked us to be uh, the partner of ABS. What was it like then, Glenda? I mean, how did this partnership take on? Hello, Marites. I have been looking forward to this interview because um, this would not be an interview, but really a conversation uh, between the two of us. Um, I remember that, um, as Maria would often say, that she had been asking me to join um, ANC back in the day when I was still with Newsbreak. And I think in one of our conversations, um, the idea came about that why doesn't Newsbreak altogether uh, become the investigative partner of ABS-CBN. Uh, Maria at that point was the head of news of ABS, uh, constantly in search of uh, new ideas, new people, uh, and new thinking. And and so that came about. Uh, uh, I, I, ag I agreed to head the ANC, ABS-CBN News Channel, but along with that, um, the partnership with um, Newsbreak uh, was cemented, and you, were, you headed eventually the the online site of ABS-CBN, and I'm sure you have your own different experience there compared to the little magazine that we ran before that. Yes, I remember that even if you were partners with ABS-CBN, we kept our office in Quezon City in Panay Avenue, which was very close to ABS. But since you brought up that memory of me being the editor-in-chief of ABS-CBN News Online, I think I took it on for only a year because that experience to me was harrowing. I remember I could, as I told you offline earlier, my butt was glued to the chair. I couldn't even leave my desk because everything was happening. I mean, news kept coming up. So it was really different from running Newsbreak magazine, but it was an experience anyway that open my eyes to online journalism and glenda you reminded me that this went on for three years before before yes. newsbreak eventually merged with rappler yeah um, um newsbreak eventually merged with rappler um, in 2011 when we registered uh, with the securities and exchange commission but um, that was already after maria left abs and i also left anc uh, early years or uh, early months of 2011. so the merger between newsbreak and at that point move that ph because that was really the original organization and facebook was inevitable, I think, because uh, the Newsbreak founders, uh, Marites, you Marites, Chai, Gigi, myself, Gemma, um, were also shared the same values right? as, as, as Maria, as Beth. And so it was a natural, not just merger, but really um, uh, collaboration um, and, and really um, a, a coming together of a dream towards independent media. Because the bar remember, Marites, that was also our dream when we built Newsbreak. Uh, we knew the hazards of big business owning media and and we really wanted to show the world that that good journalism sells and it doesn't have to be controlled by big business. And I think that was the kind of fuel also that that drove us to, to again, um, build a new dream about independent media. Yes, because news, uh, in Newsbreak, uh, I think 
it was a very difficult sell, especially because we were purely uh, hard copy. It was costly. And anyway, so we had to move online. But yes, the dream of uh, setting up an independent news organization was always in our minds. So anyway, this was fulfilled when Rappler was set up. And Glenda, you were managing editor for nine years. Parang ang bilis nung nine years, no? they have gone by so quickly. But how did this shape you as a further, as a journalist, and maybe as a leader of a news organization? Wow, um, it's a lot. But I think a part of the shaping happened before Rappler. And I think um, Newsbreak shaped me because diba, back in the day, had Rappler been born at a time when Newsbreak was born, it probably would not have been as successful diba? because then um, the traditional media was, was the dominant voice in the industry and uh, a startup would, would need a lot of resources and money to compete with the giants. So Newsbreak, in a way, trained me to, to focus on the goal of building an independent newsroom, but on the other hand, balancing that with the needs of the business. And remember, Marites, in Newsbreak, our, our cost for printing the hard copy really ate up, what, 50% or more than 50% of our budget um, every week. And, and so it was really hard, no matter how how compelling your journalist um, output uh, was, and no matter how um, great the stories were, you could only do so much in terms of distribution because you were competing with, with the likes of the Inquirer that had a national uh, distribution network. So fast forward to Rappler, we did not have that problem of distribution because social media took care of that distribution. And more importantly, it was free. And, and so the investment really went to people and the gadgets that we use. And so it was a great time really to, again, reimagine what it's like to, to have an independent newsroom because after all, you did not need much at that point to really uh, begin because nandun na yung Facebook, etc. So I think that shaped me in terms of news break, uh, balancing between business and the requirements of journalism. And my exposure for three years at ANC, the ABS-CBN News Channel, also exposed me to the live, I know, you know, uh, the producers trained, taught me so well in terms of, like, you know, their command of live events, of marathon coverage that would last, what, 48 hours, nonstop. And, and when we were breaking news at Rappler, that kind of experience at ANC, I really was able to maximize uh, in terms of breaking news and, uh, you know, being um, quick, uh, you know, uh, being um, quick to the draw in terms of deployment and assignments. So actually, Glenda, your the years that shaped you include the depth, the depth uh, of coverage in news break and the speed uh, of a TV, of a person in charge of a TV outfit. No? And actually, Glenda, looking back at Newsbreak, uh, I think that's also where I learned from you uh, how to run a newsroom because I was always a reporter. I've been a reporter most of my life, working uh, also as a freelance journalist. And then we, when we formed Newsbreak and you were managing editor, I learned how to delegate because I wanted to do everything <laughs> you taught me how to delegate. And also, I learned scale. Uh, you know, there are problems and there are problems. The big problems and small problems. So I know that in the nine years that you've been with Rappler and before that, ANC, and before that, news break, uh, you've learned a lot. Is there any lesson you can share future with future, with aspiring journalists who want to lead newsrooms, who want to become editors managing editors well i think there i would could think of three marites um one is really if you want to be a journalist then you have to be to embrace it fully which means that it's not really the safest job in the world and if you're looking for a profession that is 
um, that has no pressure or that um, that is somewhat comfortable, then go somewhere else. I think embracing journalism is, as you would like to say in Newsbreak, Marites, it's like embracing priesthood. Um, it, there's a lot of sacrifice in terms of time and resources. So there's that. Um, second would be, there's always a difficult balancing act between running the business and doing journalism. And because business and journalism naturally clash, um, there's, I think, there's always the middle of the road wherein a situation or a decision serves both um, the requirements of public interest, with, which we journalists do, and the requirements of running a business. The second lesson would be that um, sometimes um, newsrooms are told that you have to either choose to keep the company or to keep your journalism. And at Rappler, what we have learned is it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, business and journalism don't have to clash. Uh, certain decisions and the major ones uh, can serve both public interest and, and, and the business requirements of keeping a company alive. And I think that's a critical lesson because all through the years, you know, uh, at Newsbreak or ABS-CBN or even in the newspapers I had worked with in the past, um, some decisions would have to be made at the expense of the news, at the expense of an investigative report that, that, that reporters have done because, you know, the powers that be would be so unhappy and would give uh, phone calls to the business owners. So, so that's the second lesson doesn't have to clash business and journalism. The third lesson would be, I think as Marites would say, um, when you're doing, when you're managing a newsroom that is, that has a lot of ambitions, those ambitions need to be prioritized. On the other hand, attached to those ambitions are the tensions and the pressure points that come with them. And you need to also um, prioritize them. You, you had to park certain ambitions <laughs> in favor of uh, the more urgent ambitions. And alongside that, you have to park pressure points so that you, you don't have to deal with them every day uh, on the same level. So, Glenda, maybe can you share one example in Rappler wherein you had to make a difficult decision or a judgment call? Not, maybe not necessarily having to do with business and journalism or yeah. anyway, anything that is memorable to you that uh, maybe gave you sleepless nights or well, not. There would, be, uh, there would be two things. One is it's not really a specific situation, Marites, but really people, which means hiring people, moving people from one unit to another and promoting them. And letting go of them i think constantly as a manager and especially if you help found an organization that's been that's the toughest because there'd be hits and misses you you hire the wrong person you promote the wrong person or you let go of, of people who who are very much valued in the organization and and those were tough times because there is no hard and fast truth to it you know, no school or no seminar would teach you how to manage people and bring out the best in them and really identify their strengths and, and, and improve on their weaknesses. So I think that's a constant difficult judgment call because, uh, you know, as, as managing editor, I was in charge of hiring. I also had firing powers and really we were shuffling and, and a startup cannot afford failed hires or, or failed uh, promotions, deba. Right? So that will cost you a lot if that's failure. But second, particular memorable would be the Duterte years. Um, uh, there's There was always, because as a managing editor and as a co-founder, I am also a shareholder, and I think as a shareholder, I have the responsibility to keep the company alive. Um, and there was always the temptation after the attacks were hurled, 
And after uh, the SEC issued a closure order against Rappler, which remains on appeal right now, there was always that option to any business owner or to any shareholder to open communication channels with the very people who led those attacks against you, the Duterte government or allies of the Duterte. But it did not give us sleepless night. I, I, I mention it because it is memorable in the way I and the Manangs were very clear as far as that decision is concerned. Uh, we knew early on that we were facing tyranny. And I've always believed, given the experience with those great Marites, that you yield an inch to a tyrant, diba? And, and he will want more. So we never yielded an inch. And I think that's one memorable call that we made. Yes, uh, interesting, Glenn, that you mentioned the Duterte years. When in, in Newsbreak, we had the Arroyo years, but they were not as as uh, fatal as the Duterte years. I remember, Glenn, that you received a death threat. Newsbreak staffers were being monitored. You know, we all had these skirmishes, but they never reached the, the intensity uh, under the Duterte years. So I guess this prepared you for what? Duterte, the Duterte onslaught. Yes, Marites, and I, I want to remind you of one thing as well. Aside from the death threats in Newsbreak and, and the letter of the late Cardinal Sin to our shareholders wherein he said, you know, I think we are, we're an evil magazine. Um, remember there was an expose against a banker and the banker... Uh, unable to stop us from publishing, resorted to the guerrilla tactic of buying all the copies of Newsbreak in all 7-Eleven and newsstands, you know. So in a way, she was successful in, in, in blocking distribution of content. Fast forward to Rappler, walang ganon, right? So people or or. Uh, the subjects of our investigation were unable to stop us from distributing content against them. But what did they do? They attacked us as well, frontally. And, you know, nothing prepares you for that. When you, you spent your years in mainstream media and you get all these online attacks as a counter to your expose, to investigative journalism, and they invent all this you know, reputational attacks against you, that you're biased, you're a prostitute. And, you know, nothing prepares you for that. Because back in the day, ganun lang, they, you're, you're, you're charged with libel. Sure, I mean, uh, we've had a share of libel suits, but there's that. But reputational attack that is spread online that cannot be stopped by by a single person like me. Wow, that's ano, diba? Kasi... Diba sabi nga natin, our only wealth is our name. And, and, and when that name is attacked viciously and without basis, wow. That's, that's really, that was really tough. Yeah, so you've, you've gone the entire breath from, from our magazine not being read because they were physically stolen to online. It's like, it's like spreading fire. Mahirap yeah. pigilan, no? So Glenda, you were you've been executive editor for a year. Executive yes. editor meaning you know you lead the newsroom, but I think you've been leading the newsroom for the most part. So how is it different now that you're executive editor? Do you what's the difference? Well, to be honest, there's not much difference, but I think um, the difference really is it allowed uh, the promotion. My promotion really allowed the managers to really also be promoted, the, the junior ones. And it gives them a platform where they could show also the, their leadership. I think as executive editor, I, I try very hard, though I have not been completely successful, to step back uh, so as to train the young managers to make decisions for themselves and on their own, uh, to not be afraid to take those risks and commit mistakes in their own judgment calls because that's how you learn. Um, you know, it's a cliche when they say, oh, um, you commit this mistake, so you learn. But it's not as simple as that. It's it's just her having the courage to actually take the initiative 
and make those decisions without having to clear them uh, with the higher ups, thinking that anyway, uh, this is based on on the values that is shared by uh, values that are shared by Rappler. So it's really more as executive editor now, allowing the managers to to do their own discarte. Uh, and so I step back and do much more quality control and making sure that not just editorial, but the other pillars of Rappler, uh, community, technology, data, admin, and HR uh, work seamlessly together. So it's really more um, being the baton of the orchestra now, uh, more pronounced. Uh, I was then before, but I think now there's a more conscious effort to really um, live, uh, institutionalize processes because we're not going to stay here forever, right? So the Manangs will not be here forever. And I think my role now as executive editor is to make sure that the processes and the culture are institutionalized uh, and to prepare this organization for the next gen of leadership. Glenda, on a lighter note, how is your day like today? I mean, it's pandemic, uh, leading the newsroom, as executive yeah. editor, can you share, give us a view of how your day is? Is it is it 24 hours? <laughs> no, no, no. I think um, I think it's an, another lesson when when you're running an organization and and as as fast moving as Rappler, you need sleep for you to make good judgment calls. I think. I think I know that for a fact. I, I need um, I need to tune out uh, to remove the noise in from my head, so that I could think clearly. Because I think the challenge for for any newsroom manager now is really clarity of thought eh? with all the competing you know uh, sort of information, chat rooms, um, notices, notifications. You've got to be focused on on the goal. So my day like would be, on the other hand, would be really I wake up. I used to promise myself that when I wake up, I will listen to podcasts. I will take a walk. <laughs> but when I wake up, I must admit that I go on Twitter. I check the news feed. I check uh, the big stories that we missed. Um, I check conversations that are ongoing. I go to YouTube. I make an effort to go out of my echo chamber and actually go to the Facebook pages of our critics of, of the other side, so to speak, those, the rapper haters, it's, it's, um, yeah, masochistic in that sense, but it also grounds you a bit. But I think my, the difference now with pandemic is I walk the dog at least two times or three times a day, a, a week. So that keeps me sane as well. And of course, um, a lot of Netflix. And a lot of reading, like you, Marites. Yeah, maybe Glenda, one final question. No? Um, because Raptor celebrating its 10th anniversary, you know, what are your hopes for this young organization? I mean, looking forward, I, I, I'm really glad that you spoke about focus and clarity. That's so difficult in this day and age of a lot of, of noise. Actually, clarity. It's a gift these days. So anyway, talk to us about your hopes for Rappler. And you said since you're not going to be there forever, what do you wish for Rappler? I think my, my hope for the next generation of Rappler readers is that the last six years have not traumatized them, but have in fact strengthened their core and strengthened their belief that journalism is really needed in a country like ours and that really there is no no matter the obstacle they uh, speaking truth to power is a noble work, uh, profession and it's something that we should embrace and my only hope is that the duterte years have not traumatized them but have strengthened their resolve to push harder and and my wish for rappler is that it will be led by a new set of leaders and uh, and journalists and technology specialists and community activists who will then bring Rappler to another level 
uh, taking into consideration the lessons from the last 10 years and really continuing to be influential in its space and continuing to expose power for, for all its abuses. Wonderful, Glenda. I hope uh, the young journalists who are with Rappler as well as from other news organizations can take a leaf from the thoughts of, uh, shall I say, seasoned, super experienced, Manang. <laughs> Thank Marie you very Ken. much. Yes. But wait, how about you? What's your hope and wish for Rappler as it enters the next decade? Wow. Uh, you know, I think I've been um, less, I've been more distant because I don't run the newsroom. No, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i no longer involved in day-to-day -day operations. So it's still to continue the dream, the dream of really staying independent and uh, fulfilling a noble mission. I, I like to quote uh, Pope John. Is it Pope John? Pope Francis. Glenda. You're confusing your quotes. I'm confusing my folks. <laughs> Sorry. No, but I like to quote what he said about journalism being a noble mission. In fact, it's something we should cultivate. We don't think of it as a career, as a glamorous job, but it's really a calling. So it's there's some loftiness to it and there's some nobility, but with the required humility. So I think this these are all. Uh, ingrained in the young Rapplers who will run the newsroom of tomorrow. So thank you, Glenda, for sharing your thoughts and also for asking me to uh, chip in on what had happened in the past. Sometimes we forget all this. And again, congratulations to Rappler. Congratulations to you, Glenda. And we wish our readers, our viewers, our listeners, uh, more, more years with Rappler and to stay with us. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.